read this text. Uh, I'll read it, and you, you follow along, and then uh, let's try to finish this thing up. Matthew 17, Mark 9, we'll get to uh, in just a moment in the preaching, uh, when we get to the preaching. Mark, uh, Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew 17, verse number 14, and when they were come to the multitude... There came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, now if you were in the service this morning, you'll be the only person that can answer this. And when they were come to the multitude, where had they come from, class? Say that aloud, please. The Mount of Transfiguration. Who was up in the Mount of Transfiguration? Say, it's not Wednesday night, preacher, and you're asking questions. Who was in the Mount of Transfiguration? And... Three disciples. Who said, who said three disciples? Thank you. And then somebody said, Peter, James, and John went up into the mount. So we had nine disciples. So the, 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 the four, Jesus and the three disciples, all right, catch up with us on the story. And when they were come to the multitude, verse 14, now verse 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. Mm. I have been there, Brother Raby. Anyway, anyways, I, you thought I was going to say that this morning, and I, I just kept rolling right past it. And sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could, we, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. All right, we're talking about the power of prayer. Father, help me tonight. Lord, I pray you help your people. We thank you for already what you're doing. Thank you for getting uh, these that uh, have come out tonight here safely. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would be where well, we ought to be for thee as a people, stir our hearts and challenge us tonight. And Lord, those represented here want to have power in their prayer life. And uh, I pray that you'd give us that tonight. Show it to us from the word of God. Use me as the preacher. And uh, Lord, my mind is a little distracted right now. I'm going to give that over to you, Holy Spirit of God. Take me what little I have and multiply it and use it. You did so with just a few uh, pieces of bread and a few fish and you, you fed so many. And so tonight I, I don't have anything, but you have much and you can take it and you can feed many represented in the room. And uh, I think these people want to pray effectively and want to pray fervently and want to have power, want to beseech and get a hold of the throne of God because they've got problems and they've got lost family members. And they've got things going on in their life that, frankly, if you don't step in and intervene next year, uh, they may be a washout. They may not be at the place where you'd have them to be. And, uh, and so help us tonight. I love you. And uh, you've been a wonderful Savior to me. And uh, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to stand and preach again. Love. I love preaching. And I love these people. And I, it, it, it honors me that they would come back and listen to me week after week and uh, watch me carry on and go on. And, uh, but, Lord, I, I hope that these folks know that I genuinely love them. I love them. And I appreciate them. And they, they do so much for the cause of Christ. And they do so much to encourage their preacher just by their attendance. And so help us, Lord, to grow together in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll ask all these things in his name, the name above all names. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. All right. We learned this morning, we're talking uh, about the power uh, that we have in prayer. And I want to, I'm not going to revisit the whole message because it's not necessary for us to revisit the whole message, but we do. Where I left off, I'm going to pick up because you need to see something from the text, all right? I feel like Brother Mark, drinking in the middle of talking, all right? Uh, I try to get that done before, but my mouth is dried out tonight. And, uh, but here, uh, we learned this morning concerning uh, uh, what is going on here. We learned the facts, and we looked at the condition of this son, this young man here, uh, that uh, uh, his father uh, has come to Jesus and asked him uh, to heal his son. And we were sort of parked at the failure. And the failure, I want us to revisit the failure. The failure was on the part of the disciples. 
And you got to see there's some key wording uh, in the Bible that you need to understand, all right? Uh, and uh, that's why, uh, and you hear me say it every service, so I might as well just say it. That's why we have an every word Bible. Every word in there ought to be important to you. And sometimes, I would love, and we could probably spend a lot of time on this, preach about the obscure words in the Bible. Here's a word for you that um, uh, you may not think much of because you'd probably use it, uh, and we would just use it glibly, but there is so much power contained behind the word when you look at it in the proper context in the word of God. It's two letters, is, is. Let me show you the power contained in it. Now, this is off subject, Brother Raby, off subject. Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you know how much weight is behind the word is? That's not just the word is. It is a representation of a name. It is a naming. In other words, Jesus Christ is. That's his name. Lord. The word is is one of the names of Jesus. You say, how do you know that? Jesus Christ. Christ is Lord. Are you getting it? He is Lord. He is. There's power. There's weight behind that. You ought to study that out. Because what the Bible is saying right there is that who he said he is, he is. He is the I am, right? I love that when the, they came to him there in the garden, remember that? He's there in the garden, he's praying. Oh my, I wish we could have got on that uh, and looked at that. I was looking at it a little bit this morning and how he had told his disciples to watch and pray lest she enter into temptation. What did the disciples do? They watched and slept. Now you take that word and go back to another word in the Bible. While men slept. Well, I'm, 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 I'm way off. I mean, I don't know where I'm going tonight, Brother Dan. I'm way off, man. I'm chasing. Uh, but while men slept, the enemy came and sowed terrors among the wheat. Do you see how the Bible so perfectly just sort of fits together right there? While men slept. What men? Those disciples right there. And when we're sleeping, the enemy comes. So we're to watch and pray. But Jesus is there, and he's in the garden, and he's praying. And that, that massive army comes to arrest him. And they said, uh, art thou the Christ, or however they word that. You know what he said to them? I... Am. Now, the Bible, in your King James Bible, there is in italics the word he. And I won't get into why it is in italics, but here's what Jesus said to them. He said, I am. Sound familiar? Go back to the Old Testament. Moses said, who are you? And he said, I am sent you. Jesus is standing in the garden as the I am. And you want to know why that entire army fell out? You know the whole army fell over when he said that to them. Hey, listen, when you're confronted with the Christ, when you're confronted with the Savior of the world who's about ready to go and die for your sin and the sins of all of mankind, and he is toiling and he has been praying, and I mean the Holy Spirit of God is working and he is in touch with God the Father, and all of a sudden this wicked army comes and he just goes, I am. And they went, wow. Man, you want to talk about standing in the presence of greatness, buddy. It knocked him over. Because they were standing in front of I am. The wording here in this text is, is a powerful word, and it's a very small word, but it carries a lot of weight behind it. And so we're looking at the failure of the disciples in our text, Matthew 17, and then we're going to flip over to our other text, Matt, uh, Mark chapter number 9. Look at verse number 16, and I told you the failure. The man is talking to Jesus. You know, I mean, let's make a word story, a picture. The man's talking to Jesus. And, and, and he's telling Jesus, he said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic. He's sore vexed. He falls into the water and into the fire. Now, here's what he said. And I brought him to, what's the next word? Thy disciples. I want you to see, we were looking at the failure. I want you to see the complaint of the sire. The complaint of the sire or the father, the one that begat the child. What is his complaint? Number one, there is an indictment there. What is the indictment? Here it is. All right, go over to, well, it's right here, verse number 16. Thy disciples and, I want you to say the next three words in verse number 16, and, and say it loudly, they they could not. So first he's standing there, get this, 
He's standing there and he's talking to Jesus Christ. And he said, Lord, my son's a lunatic. He's vexed with devils. He's, I mean, he's trying, they're trying to kill him. And Mark 9 gives us all the uh, example of what's going on in his life. And he said, and I did the right thing. Brother Danny said, I brought him to thy. I can almost see him point his finger. I brought him to thy disciples. And what's the three words? They could not do a stinking thing. Could you imagine Jesus Christ standing there and hearing that about his disciples? I would tell you right now that that had to break Jesus' heart. For a moment, inside, Brother Josh, he must have went, Oh, my disciples. In Mark chapter number 4, Mark chapter number 5, 4, it's in my text up there, it's 4 or 5, he said, go out and I'm going to give you power over the devils. You'll be able to heal and cast out devils. That's the wording in your Bible. We're in Mark chapter number 9. He said, we have one that's possessed of a devil and I brought him to you. And Brother Zach, he said, I brought him to thy disciples and they could not. And Jesus probably went, I gave them the power to do it. What's going on? Look at the complaint of the sire. So there's an indictment there, and the indictment is, thy disciples could not do it. Are you really who you say you are? You say, that doesn't say that in the text. He's, he is saying that to Jesus right there in the text. How dare he talk to him like that? Hmm. How many things people say about Jesus let me back that statement up. How many things do people say about your Jesus? I'm, no, no. Let's be careful. Brother Jeff, I didn't say my Jesus. I said, what do people say about your Jesus? Now, I'm not lifting myself to a spiritual high, a spiritual plane higher than you. I'm asking you a question. What do people say about your Jesus? and your relationship with him, because people do talk. Lost and saved, they know your Jesus. Thy Jesus. He couldn't, you couldn't get anything done for the cause of Christ. I'm sorry, I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> Jackie's going, pastor's pointing at me, he's scaring me. Watch this. The nine disciples that were left below couldn't do it. This is the thought that came to me. I mean, when I was writing and I was thinking, I thought, we hear a lot of preaching, and, and, and it's in our Bible, uh, and, and we've seen it happen, about Ichabod being written over the church. Anybody ever heard that? Ichabod, the glory hath departed. The glory of the Lord hath departed, but the glory hath departed. That was when the, uh, uh, when the uh, thank you, what is it? The Ark of the Covenant was taken captive by the Philistine army. The glory of the Lord had departed. And one had had a child, and she called his name Ichabod. And we, we hear preachers, Ichabod will be written over the church, and the glory of God will depart. And that would be a horrible thing. But I want you to think about this phrase. As, as I was going through this, I thought Ichabod would be a horrible thing. We talked about it earlier. The glory of the Lord has departed. But how about this phrase? They could not. Are you with me? What would happen, Christian, if it was written over the Calvary Baptist Church? They could not. They could not what? Why is it that the church is an entertainment factory? And from now on, I'm going to start reference, referencing them as they could not churches because they don't really get anything done for the cause of Christ. Newsflash. Amen. You can have eight million in attendance. Listen, the Silver Dome was full today too. I don't even know if they played, but that didn't make the Silver Dome or Silver Dome, call it Silver Dome, Ford Field, whatever. That didn't make it a spiritual place. Didn't mean God was there at all. Go there and 
Why don't you go to a Lions game, see if you get your prayers answered. Go ahead and bring it to the Lions. Have them put it over the big announcement. So-and-so is here today, and bless God, they need you to just get a hold of them, beseech the throne of God on their behalf, and let's see if we can get anything done. I think they could not would be written over Ford Field. But it's written over a lot of churches because it's an entertainment factory and we ought to just write over the door. They could not. What could they not do? Those churches, those churches, I mean, Brother Caston, it ticks me off. There, I said it. It ticks me off that those churches don't get anything done for the cause of Christ. All they do is make most people a twofold child of hell. And that's what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for doing. And that's all that they do. They dupe them in and put on a big stage show for them and a big program for them and do this and do that. And they're duping young people. And if you're one of those people, you've been duped and you've been lied to. And you ought to get your head screwed back on right. And get your head out of the sand and figure out that it's a bunch of garbage because they could not because they don't stop the tide of sin or wickedness or the hell that creeps into the church. Uh, most of the congregation is wrapped up in drinking and drugs and everything else. They're no different than the world. They're no different than the concert that they were at the night before. It's all the same. It's all the same garbage. We just threw Jesus' name in. It's rubbish. Well, you preach a lot against it. Yeah, because I'm trying to help somebody. You're right. I preach against it because I'm trying to keep somebody from going down the road that they're already on. You say, well, your face is turning red and your veins are popping out. Yeah, they are. Because I'm flat sick of it. I'm ticked off. And we got to stop it somewhere. And it's high time we just stand up. And I don't care who you are. Take your finger, put it in the chest of some young person and say, dude, you're wrong. Well, no, you're wrong, preacher. You're just a fuddy-duddy and you're just old-fashioned. If you just take off your suit jacket and loosen your tie a little bit, if I take my suit jacket off and loosen my tie, what would that accomplish? Wearing a tie, not wearing a tie, that doesn't make one more spiritual than the other. I preached in a pair of blue jeans. <gasps> and people walked an aisle and trusted Christ. Just because he's not and I am, that has nothing to do with spirituality. What has to do with spirituality? And you say, you don't know where you, what you're talking about. I sat in the church. I listened to the garbage. I watched the girl dance around a cross and about wanting to crawl under my pew. Because I've been in the places where that garbage goes on. And it ain't not, ought not be going on in the house of God. Amen. But they're drawing a crowd. They don't get anything done for the cause of Christ, Brother Raby. They could not. They, they, they don't have enough power of God and spirit of God, Brother Jeff, to fill a thimble. Not a thimble full of it. I, I don't care what he says from the pulpit. They feel good. Are you after somebody? I'm not after anybody. I'm after all of us. Hey, tomorrow, I could get caught up in a movement like that. You want to know why? Because I'm as, just as much as flesh as you are, and I want to feed the flesh, and I want to have a big, big church. Well, la-di-da for you. Hey, I want to pastor 5,000 just as well as the next guy does. I'm just as much flesh as the next guy. Man, the guy that starts a business, he wants his business to be a multi-billion dollar business. And it may never get, ever get near that, but his desire is that, hey, listen, those of us that are preachers, man, we just, we want to pastor the largest church in America. Well, does that mean you're going to leave us? If I get a call, you bet. Largest church in America called this afternoon, honey. We're moving next week. Where is it? I don't know. Hopefully, God bless you, ma'am. Listen, if there was one member and it was Hawaii, I'd move. We're really looking for somebody to say, I'm there. We're in Hawaii. We don't have a bill. I don't care. We can't pay you. It don't matter. <laughs> Ten members. I got a group already going with me. Praise God. Except you, you guys, you don't have jobs either. How would we live? We're not living all in the same place, all right? We're not doing that. You're on your own, all right? We go, we're all on our own. We'll, we'll part and we'll just get together for church. They could not. They could not. They could not. Ichabod, the glory had departed. They could not. But Joshua, I'm going to talk to you personally. Don't let them dupe you. Amen. You're a young Christian. Don't let them dupe you. Amen. If they're around you, 
and they're trying to tell you something contrary to what you've heard taught in a Sunday school hour or preached from that pulpit, tell them you don't want to hear it. Amen. There you go. I said it. I said it out loud. and Everybody heard me say it, right? Amen. Amen. I'm trying to help a young Christian. Amen. Well, preacher, you know them. I don't care. Amen. I don't care if I know them or not. It maketh no difference to me. I'm not looking to win friends and influence people. I'm looking to serve Jesus. They could not. So these, I mean, wow. You know, you know something funny? You know something funny about the work of the ministry, brother, brother Chris? People will go for absolutely, I'm just talking to you, nobody else can listen in. Private conversation, people will go for absolutely anything. But when the preacher starts to preach hard, preach against sin, they'll oppose the preacher. I mean, they'll, they'll dabble in sin by the boatload, by the shovelful. But the second that the preacher starts to really get in and just start to preaching it up, man, they'll all of a sudden, well, our preacher, let's, let's just oppose the preacher. Let's get rid of the preacher. Isn't that funny? Uh, why are we like that? Anyways, all right. Are people opposing you, preacher? I'll shoot you dead if you are. All right, don't put that one on the internet, please. So we see there's an indictment, there's an implication. It's the word thy. I, I was talking to you about that word. And the word thy is just, it, yeah, there's the criticism of the scribes involved in that. There's a criticism and a complaint against Jesus there. So much stuff that, that is involved in that, and I don't have time to, 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 to park there. I want you to look with me at verse number 17, and let's look at the forewarning. All right? We looked... At, uh, at the facts about it, and we looked at the Father, and now we're looking at the, the, the forewarning. And what Jesus say in verse number 17? Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? There's a question mark there. How long shall I suffer you? There's a question mark there. Bring him hither to me. So in the forewarning, I want you to, number one, see the, cro the crowd. Now, who is in this crowd? We're standing in this crowd right now. Look around. Look around. Who's in the crowd? The scribes are there. Right? The crowd, the multitude is there. The disciples, they're standing around. The Father is there. Maybe some other family members are there. And Jesus looks at the crowd and he warns them. He said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. It's at this point that I just believe. I mean, you ought to read Matthew chapter number 23 if you don't believe that Jesus reared back and preached. Because he did. Read Matthew 23 when you, not, not while the preacher's preaching, but read Matthew 23 when you get some time. Every time I read Matthew 23, I see Jesus just whoa, rearing back and looking at the scribes and looking at the Pharisees and just saying, you generation of vipers. I mean, I'll guarantee you the veins, he was human, man. The vein popped out in his head. And why do you think they hated him? Do you think he talked to them like this? Like somebody else we know oh so well who's on TV, pastor in a big church? I won't name him, but he's in Texas. You can figure it out from there. He's got a big globe whirling behind him. Well, see, fellas. Now listen, scribes and Pharisees, there really is no such thing as hell. And if you'll read the five books that I probably didn't write anyways because I'm an ignorant buffoon, um, I had to have somebody write them for me. Uh, but if you'll read those books, you'll realize that there really isn't a place that's called hell. I don't really want to say it because it sounds bad when we use that word. I'm not talking about cussing. I'm talking about the place where people are going while me and you are sitting here. Hey, do you think that Jesus watered it down? Am I being too strong for you tonight? Get on board, man. Stay good. Say amen. <laughs> Ladies, would you please say amen? Somebody in this room, man up and say amen. All right. But Brother Dan, I mean, do you see Jesus doing that though? I mean, being just sweet and kind-hearted, Jesus was sweet. He's love. But I want to tell you, when it came time to Matthew chapter 23, Brother Raby, he reared back. He looked them scribes right dead in their God-given eyeballs, and he said, you listen to me, son. You're a stinking, you are, you are full of dead men's bones. Now, I'll guarantee you, coming from the Lord Jesus Christ, that was pretty stout speech. And them scribes and Pharisees knew exactly, Brother Zach, who he was talking about, because I'm pretty sure he probably took his finger and pointed at him. Panned the crowd. <laughs> He wanted them to know. And Jesus was a preacher, just like John the Baptist. 
If you want to be a preacher, open your mouth and just let her go. Who knows what might come out? To hang around me a while, you don't ever know. <laughs> and so, here's this crowd, and Jesus, I mean, you know, we know that Jesus got upset, don't we? What did he do when he went into the temple? He, he flipped over the tables of the money changers. He took a scourge. Brother Buddy Jr., look at the preacher. If you ever become a preacher, man, I hope you blow a vein in your forehead because you're screaming so loud, all right? Do that for the preacher, promise me. Just nod your head, yes. Amen. I'm just helping the next generation learn how to Amen. preach right. And he might be the next evangelist in America that turns the world upside down, right? Sitting right there in the pew. And his dad's got him in place. Amen. Anyways, move it on. I, I believe, so we see him flip. We see him, he takes a, a scourge and he whips those guys. I have a hard time, Brother Chris, and imagine Jesus doing that. It's Jesus. But then I read Matthew 23 and I go, yeah, that was easy, man. He just built a scourge and he went to this guy and said, what? That guy was like, what is going on? Man, this is Jesus. Amen. And he was like, that's right. You made this place a den of thieves. Now get out. I mean, he has worked up. So I can almost imagine just a little bit, Brother Dan, that he gets a little bit upset and he looks at him. He's got the, the disciples, the multitude, the father. He's talking to the whole lot of them. And I'll... And I, Here's where I'm going to disagree with 99% of the commentaries out there. All of them said Jesus was talking to the crowd when he said this. Because he said, you faithless and perverse generation. And his disciples were saved and they couldn't be perverse. You study out the wording, I think I have it written down up there, about what perverse means. And they're right. His disciples couldn't be perverse because they were saved already. It talks about wickedness and, and all kinds of things having to do with that wording. But he uses the word faithless. And there's something very interesting when you marry all of the stories together. One of the other texts does not use the word perverse. It only uses the word faithless. Therefore, in this preacher's humble opinion, I believe my commentary would say he was talking to the disciples also. And he looked at the disciples and he said, you faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Why would he just talk to the crowd? Why wouldn't he talk to his disciples? You don't think he was upset with his disciples and not being spiritually in the place where they could have cured that man and not brought reproach and shame to the name of Christ? You don't think he was upset about that? He's about ready to die for the sins of all the world. He knew that he already had enemies. He wasn't really looking for the disciples to make more enemies for him. He was looking for them to do good, heal, and cast out devils. That's why he had given them the power to do that. And so here he stands there, and he says, You faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? So we see in the forewarning, he's warning them. He's talking to the crowd here, and it is in Mark 9, verse number 19, where he just uses the word faithless. You can look it up later. Put a question mark by it uh, if you want to. So you see the crowd. I already hit this. You see the condemnation. He said faithless, and he said uh, uh, perverse. The word perverse means foul. Now, if you want to marry these, this with another verse in the Bible, uh, Psalm 14, verse number 1, would be its sister verse. The Bible says this, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. That's a faithless generation. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. That's the perverse generation. So the sister verse to your faithless and perverse generation is the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. He's faithless. He doesn't have it. And then they've done corrupt things. They're a perverse generation. We're living in a faithless and perverse generation. You guys don't have a God tonight. Whatever God you want, that's the God that'll work for you. Brother Mark hit on it this morning in Sunday school about being in the house of a Buddhist, and yet they're more faithful uh, uh, to, their, to their God, small g, than we are. So we see the forewarning was to the crowd, and then he gives them the condemnation. Now look at the fulfillment, and, and go to Mark chapter number 9. I'm out of time. Mark chapter number 9, and plus I'm tired and I'm hungry. Mark 9, verse number 25. When Jesus saw that the people, Mark 9, 25, you there? Good. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one, he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. I want you to see here, the fulfillment, look at the resistance in verse 26. There, there is resistance there. The spirit 
cried and rent him sore. This was a violent act, don't you think? This spirit was mad that he was being cast out of this boy. He liked his home, and he knew that he was going to get cast out by the one who could do it. He knew who Jesus was. The Bible says even the devils believe and tremble at God and at Jesus. And they knew who Jesus was, or he knew. And when Jesus looks at that boy, and I mean, I can just imagine he looked at him, and he looked right through him, and he looked at that spirit, and he said, leave that boy alone. And that devil is angry. And you know what it's going to do? Take one more desperate shot at killing this kid. Isn't that what wickedness does? Wickedness works very strongly against God. The moment that we sort of come to that place where we know that we need Christ, wickedness, I'm picking on you. I'm not calling you wicked. <laughs> yes. She was bringing her friend to church last Sunday night. She got a phone call a little bit late that some others wanted to come to church, so she went to pick them up. Same road she's driven eight million times, according to her dad. She knew where she was going. She picked up the friends. Her friend is unsaved. We've been praying for her friend. Well, I mean, they, they'd asked me to pray for the friend. I don't think it's on the prayer list, but, and, and I knew that the friend was coming. She got lost coming back with the friend in the car. Drove right by the road that she needed to turn down. Just drove by it. Now, why do you think that would happen? You don't think the devil would block a sign to keep somebody from getting to the house of God so that they would hear the gospel and get saved? You'd be stuck on stupid not to believe the devil wouldn't work like that. I know, we held out. You say, well, she didn't get saved. Not yet. It's still early. Hey, we're still sucking in air and breathing it back out, and so is she as of tonight. Maybe tonight she gets saved. But I'll tell you what, for about the third time, because I think she's been witnessed to a few times, Brother Jeff, she heard the gospel again while she was sitting here, and she heard it straight. And, and all that that says to me is, hey, one more person believes that. You don't just believe it, and he don't just believe it. But man, that crazy dude up there really believes it. And the group sitting around him saying amen and being on his side, they must believe it too. Hey, another seed, a seed that had been planted was watered a little bit, but the devil and wickedness tried to stand in the way of what God wanted to do. And so here he is. He rent him, and he tears him, and he comes out of him, though, doesn't he? You see the fulfillment here because this is what Christ came to the earth to do. So you'll see uh, there is resistance. Wickedness never gives up easily. It will always give another shot at destruction. Why is it when we get saved, Brother Caston, why is it that when uh, Christians get saved and they, man, they throw it all on the altar and say, I'm going to be done with this and I'm going to be done with that and I'm going to be done with this and I'm just going to clean my life up. Why is it that the very next day is when the biggest tragedy of their life comes and it drives them back to that thing again? Why do you think that is? Well, that's just life. No, that's not just life. That is called the prince of the power of the air. And if he can get them drugged back into the same mess, and it may not be a week, it may be a month, it may be a year, it may be as they begin to grow and they begin to do things for Christ, and all of a sudden the devil just creeps along and he said, oh, I'm not done yet. I mean, you may have a home in heaven, but I'm still going to destroy you while you're here and make the name of Christ look like a sham through you and make you, I mean, you'll, you'll just destroy the name of Christ to your friends. Wickedness does not give up easy. So what should we do? You better be on guard. We got to be on high alert, man. We're, we're, we're uh, at code red, right? You know, our nation goes through the, the levels there. But when we get up to yellow, we get all nervous, don't we? Hey, we're in code red. Man, we're at the top, whatever the, the, the numbering or the color system is. So there's resistance, there's removal in the B part. Under the removal, do you know that it was permanent removal? Verse 25, look at it. Come out of him and enter no more into him. Aren't you glad when Jesus does something, it's always permanent? Amen. John 5 and verse number 24. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall, brother Chris, never perish. Hey, my friend, according to your testimony, you trusted Christ as your personal Savior? Never going to die, friend. Oh, he's not? Well, me and him are planning on going in the rapture. I don't know about the rest of you. No, never perish. You'll not even feel a tinge of hell. Amen. 
not even the heat. Won't even smell the smoke of it unless when you're seeing people cast in there. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Well, when Christ does something, it's permanent. When Christ does something in my life, it's permanent. That's why I wonder about all these things that happen in people's life and it's not very permanent and I gotta wonder who it is that's done it. When I do something in my life, Brother Jeff, a lot of times it's not permanent. When I decide. I am a firm believer in the Holy Spirit of God. And that's why a lot of, I don't even know how to say it right. I'm just a firm believer in the Spirit of God working in people's life. I could preach a lot of things in the pulpit that would be preference about the way that I feel about certain things when it comes to standards. Let's just say it. And I, can, and, I, and I do, I believe in standards, and I believe we ought to have them, I believe we ought to live the right way, and I believe the things that we wear and the things that we do, and I believe that, and we do preach that around here. We preach modesty, and we preach, and that's for men and women, bless God. And uh, we preach, I mean, we do all that. But there is a right way and a wrong way to do that, because the wrong way is that people will do things because the preacher said it, instead of the Holy Spirit saying it. And when people do things because the preacher says them or because somebody did say them, and by the way, sometimes there's a place for that in your life to help you grow, but there ought to be a time in your life when you don't do something because the Holy Spirit of God convicted you. If you're doing something because the preacher doesn't want you to do it and you've been doing that for about 10 years, you're messed up. Thank you. There is a person called the Holy Spirit. He does convict and he does help. He does sort of direct. Amen. And he ought to be able to do something in your heart and he is the one that tells you. What did I say to the teenagers, Brother Caston? What did I say to the teenagers two weeks ago when I was talking to them about dress in the class? I said, y'all stand in front of the mirror and say, God, Christ, would you be honored if I wear this to church? I said, teenagers, the Holy Spirit lives within you as much as he does in me. Do you think he'll answer you? They nodded their head. I said, that's right, he will. He'll tell you. We've got to get in tune with him, and the more that we get close to him, we get that. Sometimes his voice is a little muffled by the voice of the world. Amen. Come out from among them, be ye separate. And so, you know, we need to teach people that. I mean, I'm a firm believer in that, because here's, here, and here's what I'm going. Because I find 